It's great if you have a Bible to uh, follow and we'll read the psalm. There's just 10 verses in Psalm 24. And it begins, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. For it was founded upon the seas and established upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and hasn't lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, uh, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek thy face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. May God add his blessing to that reading of his word and grant us an understanding by his spirit. Some of the Psalms <clears throat> become very special because they minister uh, to you at some particular time. And uh, for me, this is one of those psalms. Sometimes in taking funerals for Christian people, I'll be asked to focus on a certain psalm that was dear to that person. And that's a real privilege to be able to do that. Some 35 years ago, I had the privilege of taking my Auntie Ruth's funeral. Uh, she lived all her life with severe cerebral palsy. And I remember not only this psalm and her funeral, but also remember reading from Revelation 7, that wonderful picture of heaven and God wiping away every tear from her eyes. And I remember saying how my auntie, who had been debilitated all this life and couldn't really walk without anyone, without someone helping her and holding her arm, that she in glory would be wonderfully free. Well, she couldn't ask me to uh, read this psalm at the funeral uh, afterwards, but her older sister Marion, my auntie Marion, uh, had committed much of her life to caring for her sister. And she said to me, I would like you to read Psalm 24 as being a psalm appropriate for her sister. I've never uh, preached on this psalm by itself before, but as I do that today, I, I'm thinking in my mind, and I'll speak it out. Um, let's see why this would be Ruth's favourite psalm. What type of psalm is it? And it's a uh, Perhaps a hard psalm to get it to flow because there seems to be three separate subjects almost. So the middle part of the psalm is asking this question of who can stand in God's presence? Who's good enough to come and stand before God, the Holy God? 
And that subject is dealt with in verses 3 to 6. But the, start, the psalm starts uh, with declaring that God is the owner and founder of this world. A glorious start in verses 1 and 2. But then the end part is, ends in a very celebrating or celebratory way of celebrating God as the King of glory. And so we could say, like one or two other psalms we've looked at, it seems to have a flavor uh, of a praise psalm, but certainly a, pra a flavor of a royal psalm again, uh, a kingship psalm, because the part that we finish with, uh, verses nine, uh, 7 to 10, they have very much to do with glorifying the King, glorifying God, and I believe ultimately glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at this uh, psalm. And uh, because I typically try to have three points, try it tends to bring some sort of order into my thinking this psalm just lends itself exactly because there's just three paragraphs and each seems to be taking up somewhat different of a subject. Um, I'm missing my big board. Uh, I do have a small board here, but I'm not sure how to set it up in a helpful sort of way. But we'll call the sermon, Let the King of Glory Come In. So that's from the end of the psalm. Let the King of Glory come in. And my first point will be living in God's world. And this is really just dealing with verses 1 and 2. Uh, it's a magnificent opening. Let me read it again, these first two verses. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The earth is the Lord's and all that the earth contains. In other words, it's saying this entire world is God's and everything that's in it. And so um, all that it contains, and I think he's thinking of everything to do with animals and so on. But then in the next breath he says, and all who dwell in it. And so this universe that we live in belongs to God. Everything that's in it, including every living person, it belongs to God. It's God's world. And he goes on to say that he has founded it in verse 2 and created it upon the waters and so that it's God's world in that it was God who established it and God who set it up. Um, and so it's starting off the psalm with very much like a, a creation sort of theme. And we've already been there uh, in the psalm, in, especially in two of the psalms that we've been in, Psalm 8 and Psalm 19, are both very strongly, if you like, creation psalms to do with God creating this world. When it says that he founded it upon the waters, it's speaking very uh, poetically as the psalms do, but it takes us back to Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, and in the beginning God created the world, and then it talks about the Spirit moving upon the deep. It talks about the water, and that seemed that the globe was covered in water initially, and God founded it from there out of chaos. And so the first two verses take us back to the first two verses of the Bible. They take us to God being the creator. But um, they're very comprehensive verses by saying that uh, the whole world is God's and everything that is in it 
And there's another uh, psalm that says this very clearly. Psalm 146, verse 6. Um, and this is a verse that's quoted in Acts a couple of different times. Uh, Psalm 146, verse 6. And it's talking of God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he keeps faith forever. And the apostles quote this psalm a number of times, that God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that's in them. Again, a very uh, comprehensive, um, all-including sort of statement. Um, and this sets the scene so wonderfully, we can say, in that sets the scene for the truth of God, that this is God's world. Often people in rebellion will say, what right has God to, got to tell me what to do? And here is the answer. This world is God's world. He created it. And every living being that is in this world is made by his power, by his word. God has got every right to speak into anything he chooses in this world because it belongs to him. That's very, very different from the idea of living in a world that's made by chance, that so much of our society wants to believe. This is God's world and everything in it. Well, the next two sections of the psalm, they focus on an incredibly small piece of real estate in the world. And you'll notice that they're actually focusing on a point in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem itself is not a particularly big place, but it's talking about, I believe initially where David set up the tent that he placed the Ark of the Tabernacle in when David established himself in Jerusalem. David wasn't initially in Jerusalem when he first ruled as a king. He was based in Hebron for seven years and then established himself in, in Jerusalem. And we will, at the end of the psalm, be thinking about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God into Jerusalem, into this one specific place. But the second part of this psalm talks about who can stand in God's holy presence. And geographically, in those days, the people would understand that to be this tent of meeting uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then when we finish the psalm and it talks about this procession coming into Jerusalem, again, the focus is on Jerusalem and particularly on the hill of Jerusalem where the uh, tent was that the Ark was placed where ultimately Solomon built the temple. And so when God says uh, through David, the earth is the Lord's and all that's in it, one of the things he's wanting us to think is God isn't just interested in Israel. He is not just interested in one piece of real estate where the temple was ultimately built that spoke geographically of the presence of God. God's world is far bigger than that and it includes the entire world. And we could say it includes more than David's kingdom and it includes more than all of Israel. And I'm sure that my Auntie Ruth, who was a believer, saw that the world that she lived in was God's world.
Have you come to the place in your life that you believe that the world you live in belongs to God and that you as a human being are the creation of his hand and that God has every right to speak into your life? Well, my second point I've entitled Standing in, the presen in God's Presence and that's from verse 3 to 6, that bracket. It's one thing to live in God's world. And we know that heaps of people live in God's world and give no credence to God whatsoever. But it's another thing entirely from living in God's world to actually be able to stand in God's presence. God is holy. And God is pure. He's completely good. And the psalmist is now asking, who can climb the hill of the Lord? And that talks of going uphill into Jerusalem and uphill in Jerusalem itself to where this tent was, this holy place was, that ultimately became the temple. And so it's saying, who is worthy to come and stand close to this holy God. And who is worthy, worthy to come to a place that is specifically designated by God to be a holy place? Who can come? And we can say, as I've already indicated, that it means coming initially to this tent that David set up, like the tabernacle, ultimately becomes the temple in Solomon's day. But we could push the analogy further and say, it's also really ultimately asking the question, who's worthy to stand before God in heaven? Who will ultimately come to the holy place of heaven? I want you to notice the makeup of this psalm that a uh, question is thrown out and then an answer is given. And you'll see that in this section and you'll see it in the next section. There's this Q&A, this question and answer system. Um, in, this in this section, We've been here before as well because some of you will connect this with Psalms 15. I encourage you to read Psalm 15 again. It's very short. But it starts off with a, with a question exactly the same. Uh, who's worthy to come and stand in the presence of God? And then it talks about a list of different um, appropriate attitudes and qualities in our life to be worthy. And in fact, it's a more extensive list. And I'm not going to go there, and even the section we're in, I'm really just going to deal with one comment, and we might leave looking at some of these samples a bit more, perhaps for, for the midweek. But in the question and answer, it's quite possible that some of this, uh, as the Psalms were sung, and you can think perhaps of a choir singing, and it might be that a certain part in the choir might sing the question, and another part of the choir sing the answer. And uh, a lot of you have got far better imaginations than I when it comes to this sort of thing, but uh, throwing out the question by this one, and, and this group coming back with the answer. And so who is worthy? to come into the presence of God, who was worthy to come into his holy place. And he says, the answer comes back, uh, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, and so on. Well, let's just pick up clean hands for the moment. Clean hands is very topical at the moment. Um, we've got little jars of squirty hand sanitizer um, everywhere you go. And uh, 
it's not helpful information, but I find it quite hard to get it on your hands. Often you put your hand out, hit the thing, and it shoots out over here and goes down your leg or on the floor. But um, nonetheless, if you've coordinated enough, you'll get it on your hands and you can rub it in, and that's meant to kill all the bugs. I've also found that that stuff also takes your uh, signature off the back of your credit card, so watch out for that. But with this pandemic that we're in the moment, uh, using hand sanitizer is very much in our face, and uh, rightly so. And there's also this encouragement to be washing our hands more continually. Uh, it can be a bit insulting that, to think, well, did I not wash my hands before? But um, so clean hands are very much a thing of what we're having to focus on in our present situation. Sometimes at the farm when I'm sitting in the house with my granddaughters, they'll be looking at my hands and they'll say, uh, your hands aren't very clean, granddad. And I say, well, they're a lot cleaner than they were before. That's what I could get off them in the first go. And uh, so sometimes uh, with a farmer's or a manual worker's hands, you can look at his hands and tell what he was doing last, perhaps. You can read them. But clean hands to come before God, we know that that's speaking metaphorically. Um, even if your hands are literally dirty, that won't stop you being in the presence of God, but it's representative of a clean life. But often there's this picture used of clean hands, and you can think of Pilate when he was sentencing Jesus, and the, the uh, Jewish people were manipulating him, and in the end, he knew that he was going to crucify Jesus when he felt that he was still innocent and he pulled out a bowl of water and he washed his hands in front of the people and he said, I'm clean of this man's blood. And uh, we could ask the question, I don't know, Pilate, that that actually made you any cleaner at all. But the idea of a ceremonial hand washing or some of you that uh, know the... Uh, Shakespeare plays can think of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth after um, murdering someone had felt she had blood on her hands and she said oh uh, out you damn spot uh, that was haunting her as a spot of blood on her hand but we we can pretty quickly that the psalmist is saying he who has clean hands we could say he's saying he who's got no traces of sin and we could think hmm that's not very hopeful because no one has got no traces of sin on their hands if and somehow our hands would display our sins and we could say, well, did the writer of the psalm have clean hands? And I'm not sure whether he had um, committed adultery and murder before, before or after he wrote this psalm. But if you go to Psalm 51, which is David trying to seek forgiveness and cleansing um, after he had committed that sin, he was pleading with God that God would cleanse him and make him clean again. And just like Lady Macbeth, I think um, David could see the blood of Uriah on his hands, amongst other things. And in Psalm 51 verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7 says, Purify me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. One of the things that happens, especially when God's people sin, there is a, an awareness when the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin, 
that we need to be cleansed. We need to have that sin dealt with. And the wonderful thing as a Christian is that there is the way put forward for us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That if we confess our sin to God, if we repent to God, and if we ask for forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. Again, I haven't got my board, but I have four references here that might be helpful to you that uh, if you would like to write them down and look at them. And they're all references saying that the work of the Lord Jesus makes you and I spotless. And... In some of these references it says that he will make us spotless and will stand before his presence without stain or blemish. And that's incredible. And so for you and I in this New Testament time, we have a clear passage through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we could say, my sins are dealt with, my hands are clean, and your word says that you will have me stand in your presence, spotless and blameless. So I encourage you to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Colossians 1, 22. And Jude 24. And each of those texts tell us that through Jesus Christ we can be made spotless and without blemish and stand in his presence. And so, if the question was asked of us, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place, he who's got clean hands, and we could say, he who has been forgiven can, and he who has been covered by the blood of Christ And for my Auntie Ruth, whom I read this psalm for, to be able to stand in the presence of God, she couldn't stand anywhere by herself, let alone stand before God with holy hands. But I knew that uh, when our Lord received her into heaven, she would be standing by herself and she would be standing with clean hands because she had put her trust in the Lord Jesus in this world. If any of you think that you can stand in the presence of God, climb his holy hill, come into his holy place on your own merits, that is, if you think that your life is good enough without the forgiving and cleansing work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I have to say I'm sorry, but I think you are deceived. There is a way to have our hands cleansed, all the stains of sin removed, but it is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's uh, look at the last part of this psalm, verses 7 to 10, and I've called it Celebrating God's Glory. And again, it's a bit hard to connect up these different paragraphs in this psalm. So in verses 3 to 6, it's talking about us standing in the holy place before God, but now in verse 7 to 10, it's talking about bringing God himself into this holy place. 
At the very least, these verses can apply to the victorious king coming back into Jerusalem. But, they, but again, it uses terms that are too glorious and too magnificent for an earthly king, even for a king like David. Christians for a long time, ever since the psalm was written, I think, have often wondered if David, he doesn't say specifically, but it seems that David may well have written these verses for when he bought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Remember the Ark was this sacred box and it had angels, cherubim, that their wings met over the top of it and it was said that God's presence was on the lid under the shadow of the angels. And so it was the sacred box and it spoke of the very presence of God. And when David uh, was the king and he was getting established as king, he wanted to bring the ark into Jerusalem where he had ultimately set up his kingdom. And we know that they didn't get off to a good start. And you can read of this in 2 Samuel 6, or perhaps a fuller account is in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and 16. Uh, it's very good to read that if you have time, 1 Chronicles 15 and 16. And we remember that David's first attempt to get the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem was a failure. And remember that they had it on an ox cart and a man, as I put his hand out on it to steady it and God struck him dead. And so they stopped the procession. But in chapters 15 and 16 of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, it um, speaks of the second attempt, uh, which was uh, uh, successful. And this time the ark's not on an ox cart. The ark is on the shoulders of the priest where it should have been and they are bringing it into Jerusalem. It's an incredible celebration. And David himself is celebrating and dancing uh, incredibly. And if ever there was a grand procession, if you like, or if ever, if you like, God was on display, or if ever there was a royal parade, it was this bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And it says they, as they ascend, again you have to climb to come into Jerusalem, and the picture is of them coming to the gates of the city as they come in. And again we see this uh, question and answer. Um, Perhaps it's an announcer that says, lift up your gates and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. And then the question, who is the king of glory? And they give a wonderful answer. And then again, that same question is asked again, who is the king of glory, so that it can be spoken out again. Who is this, the King of Glory? He's the King of Glory, the Lord of Hosts. Uh, and again, it could be a king like David, but it seems too grandiose wording for the king. The Lord of Hosts. The Lord of a vast number of armies, or the Lord of all the host of the angelic beings. And the appeal is to the gates of Jerusalem to lift up their heads and for the doors and that to be lifted up and let the glory come in. Seems a little bit strange to us. They're speaking to, in my farmer's mind, he's speaking to gate posts and gates and doors to respond. Pay attention, you doors. 
uh, lift up your face. Uh, he's speaking to inanimate objects. Open up. Receive the king. You gates, get out of the way. You gateposts, stand at the attention. It's like that. <coughs> Be ready to receive the king, this glorious procession. Well, the psalm has started by saying all the world is the Lord's and so it shouldn't surprise us too much if, uh, if in this psalm the gateposts and the gates are spoken to, uh, to told and told what to do. But before we leave this, um, there's far more magnificence in this than I've brought out. I want us to see that does this point to the entry of another person, another Lord of hosts, another King of glory who came into Jerusalem? And I think it does. I'm sure it does. Perhaps you might like to look at Luke's account in chapter 19, verse 28, on what we call often Palm Sunday, Jesus' grand entry into Jerusalem. And we can say it was Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But if we think of the words of this psalm telling the gates to receive him, to stand up, to pay attention and to honour him as he came in, we could say, did Jesus get the appropriate treatment as he came into Jerusalem? Well, in some ways he did in that the people came out, and again I encourage you to read for yourself from Luke 19 verse 28 on of his triumphant ride into Jerusalem. And the people are praising him. Hosanna to the king. But in amongst that crowd there are people that hate Jesus and want him dead. And they come to Jesus and they say to him, Tell these people to shut up and stop saying what they're saying and praising you as the coming king. And Jesus gives an interesting answer. He says, if I tell these people to shut up, the very rocks will call out and praise my name. I'm interested that Jesus in his triumphant ride into Jerusalem said that if the people stopped, creation itself, the stones on the ground would cry out to praise him. It shouldn't surprise us that in Psalm 24 the gateposts and the gates in a sense are commanded to praise him. This is the world, God's world and he can ask whoever he likes to praise him in that sense. But Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I don't think, had the overall splendor of David taking the ark into Jerusalem. Though perhaps you could argue that uh, David's wife, who looks out the window and sees her husband dancing and is resentful, is something of a naysayer to this situation. But remember that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. It doesn't look particularly noble or particularly kingly. And as he gets close to Jerusalem and he looks out over it, he bursts into tears. And so, and begins to say, if only Jerusalem, you recognized your visitor, but you haven't. And now bad stuff's going to happen to you. And we could say, did Jerusalem honor him as he comes in at the start of that week? David's procession honored God by this ornate ark, 
with angels on top of it that was carried in and it spoke of God's holiness and presence. Later in the week that Jesus came into Jerusalem, Jerusalem degraded Jesus on a cross. Instead of being an ornate piece of handiwork which spoke of the glory and holiness of God, they put Jesus on a piece of wood that spoke of the utmost degradation. But we on the other side of the cross can see his purposes and his reason in all of this. And now for you and I, as Christians, we can sing, Lift up your gates, heads, O gates, and lift up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come. And who is this King of glory? And we could say, It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though Jerusalem didn't receive him, glorious things were happened. And that he died on the cross to become my Savior. And now as a Christian, I want to worship Jesus for everything He is and everything He's done. And these words here of this psalm are fitting for me to truly honor Jesus for who He truly is. And we could say, not only um, is this a picture of Him coming into Jerusalem, but ultimately... It's a picture of our Lord Jesus ascending back to heaven and being seated at the right hand of God in the most holy place, and if you like, in all the universe. Where you and I look from now, we can see the full picture and the full glorious picture. And I think uh, for my aunt, as we took that funeral the psalm was precious because it exalted her Lord and Saviour in the most wonderful way. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, there are many things in this psalm that are hard for us to um, tie together. But, oh Lord, we would just pray that you would minister to us and we thank you for this glorious picture of our Lord Jesus being exalted for who he is. In Jesus' name we pray.